Let us press on now and consider Thomas's theology of the temporal processions or the invisible missions of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thomas has a definite Trinitarian conception of the temporal processions or invisible missions of the Son and Holy Spirit. The eternal processions of the Son and Spirit provides the exemplary cause for the temporal procession of rational creatures. And Thomas is explicit that the rational creature returns to God in a manner parallel to the way the Son and Spirit return to the Father in the eternal processions. As we've read earlier, Thomas says, just as the procession of persons is the reason for the production of creatures by their first principle, so this same process is the reason for the return of creatures to their end, since just as we have been created by the Son and Holy Spirit, so by them we are united to our ultimate end. Now, that language of exitus and reditus of Trinitarian persons on the one side, and the exodus and reditus of creatures on the other side, drives us directly to explore Thomas's link between the two. How does Thomas relate the eternal processions of the Father, of the Son, and Holy Spirit, from the Father to the Father, and how does he relate the procession of creatures to those eternal divine processions, it's in his theology of missions. It is in his theology of the temporal processions or the invisible missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit. For Thomas, a mission of a Trinitarian person has a twofold reference. And this twofold reference is absolutely critical to grasp. It is twofold. On the one side, quote, the meaning of being sent or mission implies two things. One is oriented to the one who sent or the sender. The other oriented to the one sent or the goal to which he is sent. ST1, question 43, answer 1. In other words, the temporal processions or the missions are now, listen, are now the transitive acts of God. The acts of God outside of himself that terminate in creation. And there's a twofold reference. There is a reference in the Son and Spirit being sent. There, they have a relation to the sender. They have a relation to that end to which it is sent. A relation to the sender in God, a relation to that end in creation. And if you remember from our earlier discussion, Thomas is trying to relate the relation to the sender, the transitive, act, the uh, imminent acts of God in the Trinity, the relation to that which is sent, the transitive acts outside of the Trinity. So when Thomas is defining a mission of a Trinitarian person, it involves on the one side the eternal procession of Trinitarian person from another. The Son is sent from the Father. The Spirit is sent from the Father and the Son. That's one side of the mission. But on the other hand, and probably more importantly conceptually, the mission involves the Trinitarian person's relation to a rational creature. So mission involves that from which the person is sent and that to which the person is sent. From which, the relation to God, to which, the relation to creation. And what is of supreme interest to us, and this is so critical to appreciate, and it may be surprising for those who are not familiar with Thomas, is that Thomas and Emery speak of the relation to the end in creation 
as involving a new presence. A new presence. Thomas construes a divine person's relation to a creature as a new way of personal presence. I should put that a little more fully because I just want you to get it. A new way of personal presence. Now, Emery observes this. Quote, a divine person's mission will have two constitutive features. And he makes this more explicit. Now listen, this person's eternal procession and the divine person's relation to the creature in whom this person is made present in a new way. Italics could be added to that. Regarding the first feature, Thomas says mission implies a definite procession from another, and a divine mission is a procession from an origin. Since the Father does not proceed from another, it is not fit for him to be sent, but only the Son and Spirit, into whom being from another is fitted. And so in this first point, and we're still clarifying this, you have to understand this, and we need to take our time in understanding it. The Temporal procession brings into view the eternal procession first and foremost. And Thomas is saying that the mission cannot be separated from the eternal procession because the end of a mission is participation in that procession. So the first aspect of a mission is a relation to a sender. The second aspect is a relation to the thing sent. And that relation to a thing sent gives us a new way of existence. Listen to the way Thomas puts it. He says, in the Trinitarian mission, quote, the Son or Spirit does not begin to be present where he was not before, but instead, and this is a quote, has a new way of being present somewhere, being here in a new way which he was not present before. Now pause and reflect, end of quote, pause and reflect on this with me. In this second aspect of the Trinitarian mission, when the Son and Spirit relate in those transitive acts of God to creation, they are present personally in a new mode that they were not present before, in a new way of being present that they were not present before. This is Thomas's way of speaking of a new relation that obtains in the creation of the rational creature. When the Son and Spirit are sent, there is a new way of being present that the persons were not before that event. Emery summarizes the notion of mission, which is peculiar to the divine person, is characterized on the one side by the person's having an eternal origin, and on the other, a new mode of being for the person who is sent. This means, quote, a divine mission consists in a new mode of presence in the person sent, his rendering himself present in an innovative way. That is from page 367, Emory. Now, I'm going to say more in a bit how this relates to immutability, but I simply want you to appreciate that for Thomas, this new mode of presence is not a new mode of being, per se. It's not a change in the person. I'll get to that. But Thomas uses three related terms to describe the relation of God to the creature, and I'm going to define each of them for you. He speaks of procession, temporal procession. He speaks of mission, invisible mission. And he speaks of donation. And so the, the language that Thomas uses is procession, mission, 
and donation, and each has a special nuance. Temporal procession and invisible mission. Let me talk about their similarities and their differences. Emory observes that one can use the phrase temporal procession to mean the same thing as an invisible mission. When one speaks thus, qualifying the procession as temporal, it refers to the created effect which the divine person is in the world in an innovative way. And so what is a temporal procession? Listen to this. It's an eternal procession with a temporal effect on the creature. With a created effect on the creature. Thomas says there's no internal alteration in the divine person. The person is rather the source and cause of the creature's changing. But nevertheless, the person is present in a new way. Immutably dynamic, present in a new way. And so, insofar as you can speak of a temporal pr procession and an and an invisible mission, insofar as you can speak of how the two are alike, you have a procession, which is a relation to the sender. You have a mission, which is a relation to something outside of the Trinity. And both of them involve, temporal mission, invisible mission, both of them involve a new way of personal presence. But there is a difference between temporal procession and mission in Thomas. Here it is. A temporal procession involves both a relation of origin and a relation of destination, whereas a mission only involves a divine person's relation to a created destination. And so if you ask Thomas, what is the conceptual difference between a temporal procession and a mission, he will say a temporal procession has a twofold reference, a relation to origin, a relation to destination. Mission, when we speak of the missions, that brings into view only the destination of the person's sent. So a mission is a purely transitive conception. It involves nothing eminent in the Trinity in the strict sense of the term. So it is conceptually distinguishable in Thomas. Now you may think I'm splitting hairs, but you must understand this because Thomas uses both terms to talk about the persons of the Trinity relating to creation. He says it's a temporal procession on the one hand. He says it's an invisible mission on the other hand. How do we reconcile it? Um, the temporal procession has a twofold relation, one to the sender, one to the destination. A mission itself has only sender, uh, has only destination in view. So procession, relation to sent, relation to sender. Mission only a relation to sent. Only a relation to whom the persons are sent. One last way to distinguish, as Emery says, is that the primary means of a, pre of a procession, the primary meaning of a procession, is a relationship from a principle to a destination, whereas the primary meaning of mission intends a destination only, or the outreach of the, cre of the Trinitarian person to the creature with a created effect. Now this term donation, third, this term donation here, has its own unique character. When Thomas speaks of the donation of Trinitarian persons, the gifting of Trinitarian persons, it involves the actual reception of the divine person by a rational creature in grace. And so, so donation, strictly speaking, doesn't contemplate the relation of the divine person to the sender, as procession does, 
or the relation of the divine person to creation per se, it focuses more on the actual reception of the Trinitarian person by the rational creature. And so the defining characteristic of donation is the reception of the divine person by the rational creature to, he, to whom he is sent. And it therefore corresponds to possession. When we talk about donation, we talk about the way the creature is in possession of a Trinitarian person. What, what, a good, a good uh, um, rough analogy for us would be something like personal communion with a Trinitarian person. Now let me integrate all these features in a summarizing statement. This is me integrating it all. A Trinitarian mission consists in a Trinitarian person being sent to the creature as a gift in a new mode of presence through sanctifying grace. Let me read that again. A Trinitarian mission consists in a Trinitarian person being present to the creature as a gift in a new mode of presence through sanctifying grace. So, please hear this. When we speak of the missions of Trinitarian persons, we are speaking about a new mode of personal presence that is going to come in the mode of sanctifying, elevating, deifying grace. That's going to be its fundamental meaning. Thomas says, quote, A divine person is sent in that he exists in someone in a new way, and he is given to be possessed by someone, neither of these occurs outside of sanctifying grace. That is from ST1, 43, answer A. Question 43, answer A. So in a mission, a divine person indwells a rational creature in a new way, and is present to that creature in the mode of sanctifying and deifying grace. And it brings into view that a mission is a new mode of presence, listen, beyond what transpires in the work of creation. A mission is a new mode of presence in a rational creature that transpires beyond what is given in the work of creation. Listen to what Emery says about this, 373. He says, The gifts of grace with which human beings are sanctified are of a different kind of reality from nature. Thomas had already said as much when he put forward the general notion of mission. The new presence of the divine persons is, does not consist in a change in the persons themselves, but in a change within the creature who is enlarged by a new gift of the divine person. This is why Thomas exhibits mission by way of considering the effects of the divine persons within creatures or the new presence of the persons who are given." End quote. The new presence involves effects of Trinitarian persons, listen, dwelling in the rational creature by means of created grace, what we would call the donum superadditum. Through sanctifying grace, rational creatures can receive Trinitarian persons who enlarge them in a new way of being present in and with the rational creature. So the question becomes, how does this occur? How do we relate the work of creation to these missions of sanctifying and elevating grace? Well, Thomas distinguishes in, ingeniously, in my opinion, between nature and grace as two modes of divine presence. Two modes of divine presence. And I'm going to switch uh, diagrams now and just talk about those two modes of divine presence, uh, the, uh, and we'll call it um, 
the common mode, which is nature or creation, and the special mode, which is grace. Uh, we can call it super added grace. Let's talk about that fundamental distinction, two modes of divine presence corresponding to nature and grace. First, the common mode. Thomas affirms that, quote, as the cause is present in those that share his goodness, God is in everything by his essence, power, and presence. Because it can be seen throughout creation, the first mode is described as common. God is in everything he creates, not as a feature of creation, but as the agent is present in that which he makes. That is from the, um, the ST1, uh, 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 question 43, answer 3. Emery says, in order to convey, commenting now, in order to convey this common mode of God's presence, St. Thomas takes over a formula from the ordinary gloss of the Song of Songs, which, like everyone else at the time, he ascribes to Gregory the Great. Quote, Through his presence, his power, and his substance, God is in all things common. He is in them through his power, because all things are subjected to its exercise of his power. Through his presence, because all things are naked before the God who knows them. Through his essence, because God is in all things as the cause of their being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are present in that way as an agent is present within its effects, because divine persons act upon all created things. End quote. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is present in a common mode in all things created. Present in power, present in essence. He is present in all things in accordance with their created nature. Moreover, Emery notes this, quote, Thomas explains there is already a kind of union with the triune God within this first mode. In other words, there's already a union of the rational creature to God in this common mode. There's a union of sorts. Union with rational creatures. We'll call it a common union, not a special one. And here's the language. By dent of God's acting upon them, creatures have a communicated participation in or likeness of the divine goodness. It is thus just as much in their being as their doing that creatures are assimilated to God and receive the divine resemblance all because God operates upon them. End of quote. That's Emory, page 380. The resemblance in rational creatures resides in rational capacity that is patterned after the sun. The resemblance in rational creatures also resides in a volitional capacity patterned after the property of the sun. So if you're talking about a union of rational creatures to God, you have a rational Capacity, son, you have a volitional capacity patterned after the spirit. But this is an ordinary common mode. In fact, Thomas says this, this first mode does not enable creatures to attain to God. It is more a matter of achieving a likeness to God through his act of creation and his constant operation with the creatures he has made and makes still. You see, in order for a rational creature to attain God himself, the rational creature needs a new mode 
of presence, a special mode of presence. And that special mode of presence is not given by nature, but by grace. Not by that which is concreated and natural, but by that which is super added and supernatural. Thomas writes this, over and above this common presence, over and above this bestowal of a rational capacity patterned after the sun, a volitional capacity patterned after the spirit, over and above this, there is a special presence congruent with the nature of an intelligent being in whom God is said to be present as the known is in the knower and the beloved in the one who beloved is beloved. Within the second special mode, the creaturely recipient of God's action does not just achieve a likeness to God, but touches on the very substance of God, reaching up to God in person. End of quote. The special mode of presence, listen, enables the rational creature to transcend his created proportionality and achieve not a mere likeness to God with rational capacity and volitional capacity, but to touch on the very substance of God. The special mode of presence enables the rational creature to reach up to God in person. So this special mode of this presence of God in grace is something that elevates and reproportions the creature to God. Listen to what Thomas says. Through the procession of the word in the knowing mind, the known reality is in the knower. Where have we heard that? That's the procession of the eternal Son. And likewise, the operation of the will within ourselves is present, whereby the object loved is in the lover. End of quote. In union with God, in His special mode of presence, through sanctifying grace, just as the eternal procession of the known is in the knower, the Son is in the Father, and just as the eternal procession of the loved, the Spirit, is in the lover, Father, so the rational creature comes to know the Father as the Son knows the Father, and love the Father as the Spirit loves the Father. The union effected with God in grace through the missions of the Son and Spirit consists, listen, in a supernaturally imparted knowledge and love patterned after the Son and Spirit. Listen to, to Aquinas. Because these acts of knowing and loving the intelligent creature touches God himself, by reason of this special way of being present, we have the teaching that God is not merely in the intelligent creature, but dwells there as his temple. No effect other than sanctifying grace, then, could explain a divine person's being present to the intelligent creature in this new way. The conclusion that there, there is no mission or temporal procession of a divine person except in the shape of sanctifying grace. Now, Emory quickly distinguishes the supernatural knowledge and love in grace from the natural knowledge and love in creation. Listen to what he says. He says, this is not a matter of the natural knowledge of God. Those of you who want, you can go back and listen to lectures on the doctrine of Thomas's theology of natural knowledge and supernatural knowledge of God in the Van Til modules. But listen. This is not a matter of the natural knowledge of God, Emory says, nor of some sort of natural bond to God. Natural knowledge of God, which in other contexts must be accorded genuine value, only grasps what necessarily belongs to him as the first cause of all things. 382. But by contrast, 
in the knowledge given by faith and in the love given by charity, the former patterned after the Son, the latter patterned after the Spirit, and finally in the vision and enjoyment of God the blessed, God is not just attained as the cause reflected by His effects, but touched upon in His own being as the ultimate end, pure and simple. End of quote, page 380. Thus, natural knowledge of God mediated by sensible creatures corresponds to God's common mode of existence in nature. Whereas supernatural knowledge of God that touches on his being within the processions, that corresponds to the special mode of existence. So the natural knowledge of God corresponds to the common mode of the Trinitarian person's relation to Adam and creation. Supernatural knowledge corresponds to their special mode. And in that special mode, here is the key. Divine grace works a conformity to the personal properties of the Son, knowledge of the Father, and the Spirit, love of the Father. In the special mode of God's presence to the rational creature in grace, there is a reproduction in the creature of the unique personal properties of the Son and Spirit as knowledge and love. Emery says this very helpfully. He says that, in the writing of the sentences, Thomas puts the divine missions in the light of the Trinitarian processions as causes. In the same way that the person's procession is the cause and rationale of the creature, it causes and explains the creature's return to God. But one in the same procession of persons is the cause of creation and the cause of return to God in different capacities. That's the key rational volitional capacities by the common mode, supernatural knowledge and love in the special mode of return. He goes on. In the second, oh, in the first case, when we take it as the rationale of creation, the personal procession is the source of the natural goods in which we subsist, the source of rational capacity, the source of volitional capacity. In the second, special mode of creation, considered as causing return to God. Listen, the processional causality can be seen in the gifts that unite us to God. And the means not only the gifts which God presents himself as the principle of our existence, but also, and more importantly here, the gifts which make us attach ourselves to God as our end. To be precise, these are gifts of sanctifying grace. Creation puts us in contact with God as the source of our being and grants rational capacity and volitional capacity. Sanctifying grace puts us in touch with God himself as we participate in the divine processions as the end of our existence, the supernatural end. Thomas says that the rational creature's reditus is accomplished as it participates in the reditus of the Son and the reditus of the Spirit to the Father. Quote, As the power through which we are united to the reality which we enjoy, as much as the divine persons mark us with their seal by leaving the gifts through which we formally enjoy, that is, wisdom and love. End of quote. That's from the sentences. The mission, listen, the mission of the Trinitarian persons involves marking the rational creature with the supernatural seals of wisdom and love that correspond to the personal properties of the Son and Spirit. This becomes the central theme in Thomas' discussion of the missions. The personal properties of the Son and Spirit are marked and sealed upon the rational creature in grace, thereby affecting a reditus to the Father and a participation in the essence of God communicated in the divine processions. It's remarkable. This is Thomism. 
Emory says, once having reminded us of the creatures receiving a likeness to the communicated divine goodness in creation, he turns to the causality of the divine person's processions within the return to God, which grace effects. End of quote. Let me read that one more time. Once having reminded us that creatures receive a likeness to the communicated divine goodness in creation, he turns to the causality of the divine person's processions within the return to God, which grace effects. And so what happens? The common mode of existence in creation is a reditus, equipping the creatures with the capacity to receive grace, but the special pre mode of presence in the divine missions actually conveys the grace of the procession of persons and thereby returns the rational creature to God participating in those very processions. You see, Thomas says that in the missions of the Son and the Spirit, quote, the proper relation belonging to the divine person is represented in the soul through a sort of received likeness whose exemplar and origin is the property of the same eternal relation. End of quote. That's from his commentary on the sentences. In their missions, in other words, listen, the Son and the Spirit represent in the soul of the rational creature their own personal properties. The knowledge of the Son, of the Father in filiation, his own personal proper at, property as filiated is represented in the soul of the one who receives his mission. The love of the Spirit, which he has of the Father in his spiration, his own personal property as spirated, is represented in the soul of the one who receives his mission in sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace that enables the reception of the person of the Son and the person of the Spirit brings with it a received likeness to their personal properties in eternal procession. The missions of the Son and Spirit consist in the impartation and representation of the personal properties in the Godhead in the souls of rational creatures by sanctifying and deifying grace. The effects of reproportioning the rational creature above his human nature to participate in the very processions of God, that is the mission of the Son and the mission of the Spirit in sanctifying grace. Let me give just a couple of more quotes. Thomas says, more in the commentary of the sentences, just as the mode through which the Holy Spirit is referred to the Father as love, so the proper mode of the Son, with reference to the Father, is the Word who manifests Him. And this is why, just as the Holy Spirit proceeds invisibly in the Spirit through the gift of love, so likewise the Son proceeds through the gift of wisdom. And this manifests the Father Himself, the ultimate end to which we return. And since the likeness to the properties is, in is affected in us through the reception of these two, the person is after a new mode of existence in us, in that a thing is in its likeness, and the divine persons are said to be in us, in that our assimilation to them takes on a new modality. And it is on this basis that both processions are called missions. End of quote. Sanctifying grace conforms the rational creature to the personal property of Son in wisdom and the Spirit in love. And here's what it means to put it in a more homiletical way. The Son knows the Father perfectly in his reditus to the Father. By sanctifying grace, the rational creature begins to know God as God knows himself in the relation of filiation. The Spirit loves the Father perfectly in His reditus to the Father. By sanctifying grace, the rational creature begins to love God as God loves Himself as He returns to God in the Spirit. You see, 
This new mode does not change Trinitarian persons. That would be front door mutualism. But this new mode effects a transforming and conforming change in the creature who is reproportioned to the essence of God as it proceeds in the Son and the Spirit. I call this backdoor mutualism. Emery sums it up so well. The divine person is sent to transmit a participation in his eternal property. The Son conveys a likeness or resemblance to the modality through which He is referred to the Father, knowledge. The Holy Spirit communicates a resemblance to the mode through which He proceeds, love. This resemblance is the imprint with which the Son and Holy Spirit mark the saints for their union with God will come about through being integrated into the personal relations which the Son and Holy Spirit have with the Father, union with God is brought about by wisdom and charity as reflections of the properties which the Son and Spirit are related to the Father." End of quote. You see, the participation in the divine nature comes through participation in the personal properties of the Son and Spirit in their eternal processions. This is a thoroughgoing ontological conception of the soul being raised and reproportioned by deifying grace to the very processions themselves. So Thomas says, quote, In the way that the divine goodness is represented in the creature through its likeness, that is, our assimilation to the divine persons takes on a new mode. One who receives these gifts possesses the divine persons in a new way like conductors or conjointers to their end. You see, the new mode of presence in the missions, please hear this, requires, demands, entails an ontological reproportioning of the rational creature to his supernatural end an assimilation to the divine persons in eternal procession. And this reproportioning is accomplished by sanctifying and deifying grace. We'll talk more about the invisible, the invisible missions of the Son and Spirit. But always remember this. The linchpin of Thomas's doctrine of participation is not a bald participation in the essence simpliciter, but a reproportioning of the ras rational creature to participate in the personal processing properties of the Son and Spirit. That is how the rational creature is returned in reditus to the Father as the Son and Spirit return to Him in the eternal processions.